Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, while we give everybody a moment to join, uh, we invite you to open up the chat and tell us where you're joining us from on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Here in sunny Albany, New York, myself. Heather from Syracuse, New York. Come on, folks, don't be shy. Where are you? Living in the Bronx, Matt and Keene, New Hampshire, Rochester, Chester, Connecticut, Camillus. All right, we get a little further west. We got Indiana, Pennsylvania, Brooklyn. Carrie from Saranac Lake, my hometown. I was just up there for the Winter Carnival this last weekend. Bristol, Vermont. A lot of folks from the Northeast here. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Rich Merritt and I'll be your host today. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of Connecticut and New York whose mission it is to protect birds in the places we all need, in our forests, on our coasts, and across local communities. A uh, uh, reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will soon be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, um, and we'll have time at the end for question and answer. Um, today's webinar presenter is Steve Hagenboo um, from Audubon, Vermont. And joining us today to introduce our speaker is my colleague, Zach Borman, He's the Forest Program Associate for Audubon, New York. Hi, Zach. Hey, Rich. Thanks for the introduction. Um, before I introduce Steve, I want to let any foresters attending know that if you require SAF credits for your attendance today, um, you can reach out to me at my email, and I'll just put that in the chat for you. So on to Steve. Um, Steve has worked with Audubon in a variety of roles since 1998. Currently is a senior conservation biologist and forester with Audubon Vermont's Healthy Forest Initiative. In this position, Steve works with private landowners, municipalities, foresters, land managers, and other conservation partners to promote management activities that will enhance the health and habitat value of forest land for priority bird species. He played a key role in developing the national award-winning Foresters for the Birds program, and more recently, Bird Friendly Maple. In 2009, Steve received his master's degree in conservation biology from Antioch University in New England. His graduate research investigated the implications of maple sugarbush management for neotropical migrant songbirds. Uh, when Steve's not in the woods on business, he can be found there hiking, mountain biking, backcountry skiing, and exploring with his kids. And Steve and his wife, Dana, and their two children live in Waterbury Center, Vermont, where they run a small farm business. Welcome, Steve. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Zach. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining us here this afternoon as well to learn more, get a, an insider's look at Audubon's Bird Friendly Maple Program. Um, really appreciate folks uh, making the time to, to be with us here today. I'll just start by uh, giving a, a, a statement here for all you all that in about 15 minutes, my son is probably going to get off the bus, which will trigger both of my labs to start barking. Um, while I hope that isn't the case, just wanted to give you the heads up that that's that's the one of the joys of having a home office which is where i work from um, and i am located in waterbury center vermont um, with you can see behind me uh, an image of my own woods um, that i use for maple syrup production among other things so again thanks for all for being here and let's take a dive into um, our bird friendly maple program so what we're going to be exploring a little bit about today put up here in our, our oven bird is taking a look at the agenda for our program. We're gonna start off just kind of getting everybody on the same page with a, a maple sugaring uh, primer. Uh, what is maple sugaring about? And that way we'll all be on the same page knowing that, that folks are, are coming, joining us today from, from various places where maple uh, sugaring may or may not be an activity that takes place. Then this question around birds and maple syrup, what is the connection between these two things? They might seem somewhat disjunct from each other, um, but in fact, we'll learn that there's there's very close association between the two of them. What is a bird friendly maple forest and what kinds of birds can be found there? And then we'll wrap up with how to identify different bird friendly maple products and give you some um, uh, kind of a heads up on where you can search for those products if you're interested in purchasing them. So as we we hear in February, kind of the mid part of, of February, we're still certainly in the in the midst of winter here in the North Country, but we are in that period of time that's the transition, um, transition from, from winter into spring. Um, and the images that you see here are somewhat common images that we start to see happening around the landscape, especially in, um, in Northern New England, New York, 
um, and even in the mid-Atlantic states, the upper Midwest, these are things that we can expect to find this time of year. As people are starting to get ready to make their maple syrup and other maple products, um, just some of the images we see, these are all images from um, Audubon, Vermont's Green Mountain Audubon Center, which is located in Huntington, Vermont, where we, we make maple syrup as well. So just, just real quick on the, on the kind of the house of, of maple syrup production. On the left image there, you'll see a picture of myself actually um, in the process of tapping a tree. We call tapping a tree when we, we take a drill um, and we drill a very small hole into the part of the tree where the sap will start to flow when we have the right weather conditions. And those conditions would be daytime temperatures that are up into the 40s, well above freezing, but nighttime temperatures that still drop below freezing. When we get that freeze-thaw cycle happening, we start to see the sap moving within the maple trees and it'll come out of any opening in that tree, whether it be a branch that a squirrel broke off or in our case, the holes that we've drilled into there. Once we've done that, we hang a small, uh, tap a small little spout or, or spile or tap into that hole, which is hollow. And the sap will flow through that hollow tube out into the bucket that you'll see on the bottom left there um, of, that we hang onto the spout or to the tap. And the sap then drips into those buckets on days when, when it's good for a, what we call sap run. From there, the sap is collected and taken to a sugar house, which we see in uh, kind of the upper center part of our image here. And this is the Green Mountain Audubon Center Sugar House, which is a very traditional, all of these images really are a traditional way of making maple syrup, um, including the buckets. And that sap on the bottom right there, you'll see boiling away in what we call the evaporator, where essentially we're doing one thing. We are taking the raw sap, which in most situations averages somewhere between one and a half to 2% sugar, the rest of it being water, and, and evaporating away all the excess water that we don't want so that we get to maple syrup, which has a, a sugar content of 67%. So we need to evaporate a lot of water out of sap, concentrating it down until it gets to be the right density that tells us that we have that 67% sugar. And that's pretty much the process right there. Um, now there's a lot of work involved in it. And the way that we, we harvest our sap and collect that sap and process it has changed quite a bit over time. So in some places where you go, in many places actually today, the sap is not collected through the use of those buckets anymore. Um, in the upper left there, you'll see um, what we call the, the pipeline network, a series of plastic tubes that run through the woods connecting the individual trees that we've tapped. Those then going into bigger tubes called main lines that will run down to the sugar house itself or to a collection tank where the sap is then transferred to the place where it will be boiled. Down on the bottom and on the right, we see images of a more modern um, kind of larger scale in many cases uh, processing of that sap into maple syrup. So there's a sugar house in the upper right, um, very large in scale. And then down you'll see the evaporators where the sap is actually processed. There's quite a few evaporators there because they have a lot of sap in this particular situation. So the way that the sap is collected, the way it is processed and boiled down into maple syrup um, has changed a bit, but in the end it is all um, coming out and equating to one thing. And that's this final product of pure maple syrup um, or other kinds of maple products, not just syrup alone, which, which many people like to enjoy, not just on pancakes, but certainly on, on many other things as well. And I wanted to show this um, map because it does kind of give us a good representation of where in the US we find maple production happening. And, and maple production really is a, is a North American um, activity. We don't find it happening anywhere else in the world except for North America, the US and Canada. Um, and these are the places where um, syrup is produced, not, not so much concerned about what the numbers all here are. The darker the colors, um, that's where the, the, the majority of the syrup is made. So Vermont um, typically comes in at number one in the country for maple production, followed by New York and Maine being the third. So those are typically the top three in terms of production. But you can see that, that, that people make maple syrup all throughout the Northeast, the Northern Forest region, the Mid-Atlantic states, moving into the Midwest and the upper Midwest in particular. And I want you to kind of just keep this, this map in your memory, if you would, um, particularly the, the upper, mid, upper Northeast um, and the upper Midwest areas, because I'm gonna have you try to remember the relationship of that to a map that we're gonna see here in a couple of slides. So there's a lot of attention that is given to um, the forest. That, that provide the sap where those trees are tapped and that sap is collected from during the maple sugaring season. People think about it, they love to see the buckets hanging out on the trees. Um, they love to, to know that there's lots of activity 
happening out of those woods that's going to all um, end up creating this beautiful, delicious treat that they all enjoy having. But less attention is given to those forests or what we tend to call a sugar bush. Let's move some things around here. Screen. Um, these forests that, that are used for maple production typically are called sugar bushes. Little attention is given to them outside of the maple sugaring season. But the reality is, is that there's lots of activity happening in these sugar bushes 365 days a year. Um, it's not just during that, that time of year when we're making maple syrup. And um, a sugar bush, just to, to kind of frame that as well, it, it's not um, a, a shrub or a bush. It's, it's a simply the name for a forest typically that has a high percentage of, of maple trees um, that is managed and used for the production of maple syrup. So here in, in Vermont and Northern New York in particular, we tend to find forests that are, that are has sugar maples, one of the dominant species, American beech is another one, yellow birch would be another dominant species, typically we find in these forests. Other parts of the maple producing region, those tree species will vary, but still have that maple component, sugar maple and red maple both. So our sugar bushes, Outside of the maple production season, one of the things that we really think about as Audubon of the excitement that goes on there is the habitat they provide for some of the bird species that we at Audubon focus on. These being uh, some of the neotropical migrant bird species that, that Audubon um, has conservation programs to work around. Neotropical essentially is a term which means, uh, refers to a bird species that the majority of the winter population of that species goes south of the Tropic of Cancer, and, and then that, that population moves more north of the Tropic of Cancer for the summer breeding months. So these birds that we see here in the upper, upper left is our beautiful scarlet tanager, which is really the, what we call the poster bird for the Bird Friendly Maple Project. On the bottom left is the black-throated blue warbler, and on the right we see wood thrush. So these are all birds that um, we could find nesting in our sugar bushes if everything kind of aligns for them to be there. And really the importance of our sugar bushes to birds is, is to be illustrated by this map here. And so this map is showing us the results of a program called the North American Breeding Bird Survey, um, which is one of the longest running bird survey programs that we have going on here um, in this country. And it essentially tracks populations of birds over time. Um, these are the results of the study that um, are specific to forest birds. So the darker the color, the greater the number of forest birds that have been encountered on survey routes. So if you look at where the darker, darker colors are here, they're in Northern New England and New York, down through Pennsylvania, kind of uh, stretching down through the Appalachian Mountains and the upper Midwest. And this is where I'd like you to, to think back to the map that I showed earlier where maple production happens. And you'll see that pretty much the high, uh, what we call species richness, high numbers of bird species that we find in our forest correlate very well with the places where maple syrup production happens here in the country. And so that for me says that our sugar bushes, those places we manage for maple production are really critical places for forest birds as well. And so with all of that in mind, these are healthy forests for our birds. With all of that in mind, um, in 2016, um, Audubon Vermont, which is the state program, the Vermont State Program of the National Audubon Society, developed in, in partnership with the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association and the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, the Bird Friendly Maple Project. In the last two years, two to three years, Audubon New York, um, a sister program to ours just across Lake Champlain, um, worked with partners as well, the New York State Maple Producers Association and the Cornell Maple Program to bring bird friendly maple um, to the New York State as well. And Zach can tell you a little bit more about that if you have questions towards the end of the program or you can put those questions in the chat as well. So right now, bird friendly maple is a program that exists in both New York and Vermont. Um, it is again, it's something that we, we really uh, intentionally focused on working with some key uh, stakeholders and partners within the maple industry in order for this to resonate well with the people that are making maple syrup um, and to, to hopefully achieve the results that we're looking for. In terms of what those results are, we do have some goals for the program. Um, the, sorry, I, I paused when I, I have to kind of move my uh, Zoom control screen around a little bit. Um, so Bird for the Maple Program project, what we're looking for in here in terms of our goals, first thing we wanna do, we wanna promote sugar bush management. And remember, 
sugar bushes are those forests that are used, they're managed and utilized primarily with the idea of producing maple syrup from collecting sap and, and processing the syrup. So we wanna promote management of those forests to, that integrates bird habitat with sap production. So it's not just about um, having maple syrup coming out of those forests, but also recognizing the important role that those forests play for birds and the habitats that they need. We also wanna provide a meaningful way to recognize those maple producers for their intentional efforts to integrate birds into their sugar bush management. And this is something that um, is kind of unique um, within Audubon to, to this program. And we call it a market-based conservation. We'll talk more about what that means a little bit later in the presentation, but it's a way for us to, to kind of uh, encourage folks through, through some sort of recognition um, to participate in this program with us. We also wanna increase public awareness of the interrelatedness of the maple industry and bird conservation. And finally, we really are also interested in promoting pure maple products. Uh, maple syrup is a natural sweetener, um, actually has some, some great health benefits. Um, and as we'll find, uh, particularly if, if those sugar bushes are managed in certain ways, um, has many, many more benefits to birds and biodiversity than, um, than some of the other types of, of, of syrups that are produced um, or sweeteners, I should say, that are produced. So we want folks to think about using pure maple products as a way to sweeten the foods and, and beverages that they're interested in. So of all the things that we talk about today, perhaps one of the most important uh, points or messages that I hope everybody leaves here today with is this. Sugar bushes are inherently good for birds because they keep forest as forest. So if someone is going to get involved with producing maple syrup and they have a forest, they want to keep that forest intact. They want to keep the trees that are there there. What they don't want to do is convert that forest to some other use. Um, they don't want to, um, to, to parcelize it and sell it off into different lots. They want to keep that forest there. And first and foremost, one of the greatest threats to any of our, of our birds, particularly these neotropical songbirds that we're focused on in the program, is when that forest is no longer there or when it's broken into smaller, what we call fragments, uh, forest fragmentation, small um, disconnected pieces of forest relative to uh, rather than larger uh, blocks of forest themselves. So it would, be, it would be normal at this point if you're kind of wondering to yourself, okay, so if, if these sugar bushes and, and then maple sugaring by extension is good for birds, then what's this bird friendly maple all about? Or perhaps you're wondering to yourself, wouldn't all maple syrup production be good for birds? Um, if you're saying that sugar bushes are inherently good for them. But the answer to that question is yes and no. Really what it comes down to is how well those forests are managed or in what way those forests are managed and whether or not the habitat needs of these migratory songbirds are gonna be accommodated. When those needs of the songbirds are accommodated, then we're more likely to find those songbirds uh, doing what they've come here to do, which is nesting, um, and successfully raising the next generation of their species. If the habitat conditions, if it's just a forest, but it's, it doesn't have all the, the bits and pieces that the birds are looking for, if they're, not, if they're not readily available, that forest is probably not gonna do as well of being productive for birds and allowing those birds to, to nest and get those, those fledglings off come fall when the birds will migrate um, and keep that whole, that whole system, that natural life cycle going. So yes, they're good for birds. Sugaring is good for birds inherently, but it, we do have to think about how we manage those forests um, in order to make them not just okay places, but really great places where birds are successful um, in, in nesting and raising the next generation of their species. And that's what we're gonna be taking a look at now is, is what are the different parts of a, of a sugar bush that make them bird friendly? What can people do when they're managing those forests that can help to make them a more bird friendly place? So the first image I'm gonna show you here of this sugar bush it's pretty, isn't it? It's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, it's almost a, a park-like setting, if you will. We have a lot of maple trees, um, which are, are um, scattered about here through this forest. We've got an understory. The forest floor is, is also quite visually appealing. It's really dominated by hay-scented fern. So it's a nice looking uh, kind of forest. But if you look in the, in the trees themselves, you see this is the, the tubing network that's connecting the trees. Most of the trees that we see in here are, are maple trees, which certainly is something if you're making maple syrup, you'd, be, you'd wanna be shooting for. So we're gonna call this sugar bush number one, the image that you see here. Now let's move ahead. 
to look at these two. And, and these are um, from different sugar bushes, but we're going to call this sugar bush two. Um, the images are, are that we're seeing here are somewhat different. They're both places where sap is collected and turned into syrup, but we see some significant differences between visually between what we see here and what we see in, in, the, in sugar bush number one. And I'd like to just pause here for a moment um, and invite all of you, if you'd like to, to just put into the chat something that you think is different between sugar bush two, which we're seeing here, and sugar bush one. I'll give you a, a little bit of time. I'm going to turn my chat on here so if I can see it as well. And don't be shy. Oh, great. Seeing things like there's more variety, there's color, uh, biodiversity, understory, mixed fill. Lots of lots of great answers here coming in. Tree age diversity, Ooh, conifers. I'm seeing someone saying in there. Oh, there's conifers in one of them, more light in number one. Okay. Awesome. So you're well on your way to understanding um, some differences that can exist within sugar bushes and then um, what could be, uh, which one of them could be more bird friendly. So let's go back to sugar bush number one. And in this image, what we're seeing is essentially maple trees in terms of the composition of the forest. There's really nothing else that's there. There are many other things that are going on here as well that people were noting. Um, we're going to address those when we move to the, to the next uh, component of our bird friendly sugar bush. So hold on tight for that. In sugar bush number two, we do see different types of tree species. On the left side there, that tree in the foreground is an American beech. Um, in the background, way in the back there, I can kind of see the, the lighter gold or golden color of a, what I believe is a yellow birch. Um, I think there's white ash on the, on the, on the side there as well somewhere. On the right side, we do have softwoods or conifers, the, the needle bearing trees, um, eastern hemlock, red spruce, balsam fir, things of that nature. So which one, sugar bush one or sugar bush two, is likely to be more friendly? Well, let's, let's see if we can just uh, get that to show up here with a bird friendly maple sugar bush is one that is more than maple. So kind of a mantra to live by. Of course, maple is going to always be something we want in the forest when we're making maple syrup. But if we don't think about also having a diversity of other tree species, not only are we not going to have the same number of um, total number of birds or number of different species of birds that we might find in a more diverse composition sugar bush, those forests are also not going to be um, as resilient to um, insects and disease, forest pests than one than those that are more diverse. So. Thinking about diversity of trees that are in the forest is really a critical aspect of being a bird-friendly sugar bush. For those producers that, we, that are interested in being part of the bird-friendly maple program, um, what we ask for them to do is think about managing so that they have at least 25% of their sugar bush in something other than sugar maple. So at least 25%. And that data comes, that, that, that recommendation is coming from, um, as Zach mentioned, my, my master's level research kind of looked at this question. And we found a nice threshold there that suggested both greater species richness or greater number of bird species when the sugar bush had more um, with greater tree diversity, um, greater than 25%, as well as from other research that has shown um, less intensity and duration of insect um, and disease in those sugar bushes. So there's, a, there's a, I don't think it's a coincidence that the birds and, and the insect and disease components all kind of match up in this threshold. Um, it's definitely something I think works kind of through the natural system that those numbers align pretty well. So what kind of birds are we really benefiting when we think about having diversity here in our sugar bush? Well, one of the first ones is, our, is that poster bird, that scarlet tanager that we've talked about. We know from, from some of the, the research that's been done here in the Northeast that scarlet tanagers and many other insect eating songbirds, which is most of the ones we're talking about, um, they, if they have a choice to find a tree species to go foraging for those insects on, they're not gonna pick sugar maple as the top pick. Things like yellow birch are often going to be selected if they're available. Exactly why we don't know. One of the reasons could be is that yellow birch has a very short leaf stem. So when the bird is perched on a branch, it can easily, more easily, kind of reach out and, and grab an insect from underneath that, that leaf. Whereas on a sugar maple, the leaf stem is quite long, which makes it a lot harder for the birds to get them. So we know that sugar maple tends to be less utilized for foraging for insects than some of the other tree species do. So that's why our, our scarlet tanager really benefits from that diversity. 
Then we have this brilliant songster here. This is a Blackburnian warbler, the male of the species. That's also the male scarlet tanager. Um, plumage differences, of course, between the male and female during the breeding season. Um, so this, the, the Blackburnian warbler on the bottom, would one that we'd likely find in that sugar bush image we see on the right here, where there's the softwoods or the conifers, because Blackburnian warblers tend to prefer forests that do have a component of softwood, eastern hemlock, white pine, um, red spruce, things of that nature. And because that sugar bush on the right does have that softwood component, that's exactly where we expect to find this, this bird species. Okay. So another thing we're going to think about in terms of what does it mean to be bird friendly. So this is going to, again, we're going to say sugar bush number one um, in this case. Now, just a couple things to point out here. This forest, this sugar bush is quite a bit younger in age than the ones that we saw there in the first example. So we have to take that kind of a, um, as a caveat. But, um, but this nonetheless is a place that, that syrup is, sap is collected from the process in the syrup. So here we have sugar bush one. And you will note there is some diversity in species that the white bark there is, is kind of a giveaway to the, the paper birch or white birch um, that's in this, in this woods. And this is gonna be sugar bush number two. So again, two images, but representing what we're gonna call sugar bush number two. So we have sugar bush one and sugar bush two. And if you'd like to go ahead again and and pop into the chat some things. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Some of you were also were already referencing this in the first example, um, but we're going to reference it again in this example. So go ahead and pop into the chat some differences that you are seeing between sugarbush one and sugarbush two, two here. Understory, herbaceous ground cover, structure, good word. Uh, so more diversity in shrub layer in number two. No understory in number one kind of all the same, excellent. Okay, so folks are, are multi-aged, excellent. You got it. All right, so for this example, what we're thinking about for our bird-friendly sugar bush is thinking in like a layer cake. So in our forests, um, we can have the kind of forest like we see here in number one, where it's essentially just the trees that form the canopy of the forest. There's really nothing else that's there. Um, but in these images, we see that there's different layers. In fact, we, we look at the forest from our bird habitat perspective really in three different layers. The first is closest to the ground, what we see most of all on the left here. This is uh, the plant you see underneath the, the blue tubing there is mostly something called hobble bush. And hobble bush is a native shrub that grows um, here in the Northeast, particularly Northern New England um, at, at mid or, or higher elevations typically. And it grows, it's called hobble bush because it grows in very dense, thick mats, as you can see right here. So when you're trying to walk through it, it can almost hobble you uh, because it's the way the branches all entangle with each other. And that understory, that hobble bush is in, in what the understory layer that we define as a layer from about ground level to about head height, six, five, six feet tall. And we have birds that really need that. We're going to find out who those, at least one of those are here in just a moment. On the right side, we're seeing the next layer, what we call mid-story. So this is everything from about head height, five, six feet, up to about 30 feet. So about, in many cases, midway up through the, the, the canopy of the forest. And in these places, um, we find a different suite of birds. So birds are kind of partitioning themselves out in the forest to find the places that match their nesting and foraging um, places. They can't all use the same layers of the forest. So birds will, will separate themselves out to use the diff these different layers. When it comes to managing these forests, sometimes we don't always find understory and midstory um, in a sugar bush that's been, been extensively managed. The reason being, you can imagine on this, the left side there, if you were trying to install this, this pipeline system, or if you're going around and you're working to uh, just check on things or you're, it's tapping season, or you're checking for any leaks that might be in your tubing because the squirrels might've chewed on them, it's a lot harder to walk through some of that stuff when it's densely growing as, as you see it here. So sometimes it's cleared out, clearing that understory is cleared out, especially in the bigger, where the bigger tube runs called the main line, uh, just to make it easier to install that stuff. Um, but from a bird perspective, that's not something that we would find desirable because we have birds like this one. Oh, there's our later cake. This is our black-throated blue warbler that we saw earlier on. Very common bird in a sugar bush if we have a nice, well-developed, understory layer, at least in patches. It doesn't have to be everywhere. 
but there have to be patches of good understory layer like we see here on the left, this hobble bush, because that, that is where this bird will, will, will nest really. Um, and in fact, hobble bush, if it's there, we can almost guarantee that somewhere in the hobble bush, a black-throated blue warbler is going to nest. I've found numerous nests, nests over the years of this species utilizing that hobble bush because it's the exact, as someone uh, mentioned in their answer, it's the structure um, in the forest that that bird is looking for us. But in the absence of, of that understory layer, we often don't find a black-throated blue warbler in our sugar bushes. The next bird we're going to look at is, is another one that we, we got to meet earlier on. That's our wood thrush. And the wood thrush tends to nest, nest in the layers that we see more on the right side, that mid-story layer. So that six to 20 foot layer um, is typically where wood thrush will be found. It's typically where birds like red-eyed vireo, one of the more common species, uh, neotropical migrants in our sugar bushes is going to be found. Um, so it's a really critical that we have this different layers, this layer cake effect going on in our sugar bush so that we can accommodate these different bird species. Not only that, but if we want to think about the long-term sustainability of these sugar bushes so that they can be producing maple syrup well, well into the future, we have to think about what's the next cohort? What's the next forest? Where is it coming from? And if we're clearing out all the young trees that are trying to grow in the understory, we're, we're taking away that opportunity for trees to, to kind of move on through the mid-story and then eventually up into the canopy as well. So just from an overall forest health perspective, we'd like to have um, a variety of structures, a variety of layers of vegetation that are all part of the natural forest. So we ask producers that are involved in our program to think about these things, to practice management, do forest management that will help to either um, establish some new growth in the understory, or if there's some there, but it's really shaded out, giving it more sunlight by creating some small holes in the forest uh, canopy, by harvesting some trees, getting sunlight there and allowing that stuff to grow. So actively managing the forest is something where we are heavily promoting through this program. Um, just leaving the forest alone can also work, but it's not going to create some of these attributes that we're looking for on a time scale that we really need, which is now. Okay, so from here on, um, we're just going to kind of point out the things that are that we that we look for, um, and we've got some kind of the mantras here in the upper uh, part of the of the slide with the quotations around them. So dead wood is good wood. Of course, the living parts of the forest are absolutely the necessity, but not to be overlooked are the, the dead parts, the dead wood as well. Both the standing dead wood, like we see on the left, um, in, in the form of what we call um, snags, which are standing completely dead trees. Or another term we often use are cavity trees. Cavity trees can be live or dead trees that have holes in them, whether they were excavated by a bird or they're naturally occurring holes that birds can either use for nesting in or that they uh, have used to, to try to find insects, particularly in those snags, um, the, dead, uh, the dead wood that the insects may be in and the birds will go looking for them. The other thing that's important with dead wood is on the right side there, downed woody material. So every standing dead tree, every snag, eventually becomes down woody material. And I wanna just highlight here on the left. So that, that snag um, that you see there with all the holes in it, this is actually in my sugar bush um, that on my land that, that we, we collect sap from. And I'm very proud of that snag. I left it there. You can see the tubing um, that runs on both sides of it. But Last winter when I went up to start the season, I came across the scene that I just kind of put up here on the bottom um, of that image, which is the downwind material that now exists. So that fell down. And when it did so, it actually took the line that's in the foreground um, down with it. So it, th this requires extra work on the producer's part because now we have to go and we have to either repair lines, you have to kind of cut them, cut the tree to get it off the lines, but it's all, it's us as humans working within natural systems. Um, the forest and the forest processes. And this is all natural stuff. So we have to be willing, uh, in my mind, to be able to work within that system, even if it sometimes requires more work. Uh, the, the one on the right, the down woody material, very large tree, obviously, that has come down. That, that also is in a sugar bush um, and provides a myriad of, of services, um, not only to birds, but to the forest ecosystem. Of course, those things will, um, will eventually rot away and nutrients will be recycled back into the ground. Um, when we leave the tops of trees, if the trees come down, we have the fine branches, they can help protect the seedlings that are growing in the understory so that things like deer can't come and eat all the young growth and, and take away that understory that the birds are looking for. So there's lots of other ecological benefits beyond birds to, the, to these, um, this deadwood. But highlighting some of the birds that we think about here, the first one 
Um, for our snags and cavity trees, these are our pileated woodpeckers, which you can see pretty, pretty cool to find that image where a bunch of them were on the same tree. But in fact, the holes on that snag on the left were holes that were, their, their feeding cavities that were excavated by pileated woodpeckers. So when you see those big oval holes like you find there, those are designed or were done for the purpose of feeding, not necessarily for nesting in because they're a little big. Um, birds don't, when they're building, excavating for a nest, they don't want a really big hole. They want something that's smaller that they can kind of just squeeze themselves into. Um, so those are the feeding cavities. And then for the downwardy material, we've got the one bird that's really not a songbird. Um, this is um, a game species, the ruffed grouse, or in some places known as the partridge. Um, and ruffed grouse utilize, the males will get up on those pieces of downwardy material, those logs, and do uh, drumming. So they, they're not songsters, so they're not singing to attract mates. They get up there, they start hitting their wings against their sides. They start doing faster and faster and faster until it makes a drumming sound. And almost when if you're out in the woods and you, you kind of think off the distance, you hear somebody's trying to the pull star a lawnmower um, burm, burm, kind of sound to it, but it's really the rough grouse doing its drumming um, in the springtime. So that downwind material becomes important for that species in particular. And then the last thing we're gonna look at here with this is, is saying yes to native plants, which means we're saying no to non-native or what also referred to many times as invasive plants. Now in sugar bushes, there typically isn't a lot of planting that is happening. Um, we rely really on natural regeneration of the forest to get new growth coming in. But nonetheless, planting of non-native plants like here we see on the left is a Japanese barberry. And on the right, we have a honeysuckle species. Those are things that have been kind of historically used in ornamental planting um, and those escape and they get, they get, the seeds get transported sometimes even by birds, unfortunately, um, into the forest, into the interior of the forest and those plants get a chance to get established and grow. And there's lots of ecological um, issues when we have a, a very heavy non-native plant infestation in our forest. One of the big ones for birds that we think about both of these plants produce um, a fruit, especially the honeysuckle. It's a, it's a soft mast, we call it. So it's a soft fruit. And birds, as they get ready for their fall migration, they eat a lot of um, soft mast. So they're eating insects most of the time they're here and then they start to add more fruit to their diet. And they're gonna find what they can, whatever is available. And if we have these non-native plants um, producing a lot of, of fruit, the birds are likely to eat them. And in many cases, um, it's been shown that the fruit of the non-native plants just are not of the same nutritional quality as the native fruits. Therefore, the birds are not necessarily leaving here in the Northeast in, when they head out in migration in the same level of fitness or health as they might be if they were eating native plant, uh, for the fruit of native plants. The other important thing about non-natives is that they don't host the same diversity of native insects. Um, I might've said that wrong. Non-native plants don't host the same diversity of native insects that native plants do. So we really, knowing that insects are a key part of the bird's diet when they're here with us, we wanna make sure we're, we're giving them as much opportunity to find those insects as they can. So the management strategy here is if we find these and we ask producers that, that get involved in the Bird Friendly Maple Project to think about this, when you have non-native plants, think about what you can do to maybe not eradicate and totally get rid of them. In certain situations, that may be almost impossible. In other situations, if you don't have a lot of them, you can manage them and control them. So different ways to do that. This is just an image of um, myself, my colleague, uh, Mark Labar at the, at the Green Mountain Audubon Center. We, we had a, some, um, some bittersweet come onto a site that we had done some, some forest management on, unfortunately. And so now we're working to, uh, to try to control that before it gets out of hand. And in this case, we're just physically um, removing it um, by cutting it out of this sapling when it was starting to climb up. So we ask again those producers to, if you have non-native plants, what can you do to try to manage and control so that they don't become um, an extreme problem? So once we've gone through understanding what the bird from the forest or sugar bush looks like, now we think about, okay, how do we get those maple producers who are interested in this kind of on board with us? How do we get them to be participants in the program? And this gets into how we then recognize producers for um, being uh, very intentional about managing with birds in mind. So the first thing that we do um, on the left side there is, is we send in, in New York, it would be Zach, in Vermont, it would be myself, to go out and pay a visit and do a site visit to the sugar bush of the producer that's interested in the program. And we do an inventory and assessment 
of those woods. We want to collect data and match it up to the standards and guidelines that we've established for the program. That image on the left is, is Steve Wheeler. Um, he's um, the owner of Jed's Maple Products in Derby, Vermont, one of the earlier producers in the, in the Vermont program. He was helping me do an inventory there. He's measuring the diameter um, of one of the trees in his forest, which is a metric we collect. Um, then in the middle, we've got uh, Matt Davis on the right and myself um, from Little Hogback Farm. Matt is from and his wife, Caitlin, Little Hogback Farm, another of our participating producers. So this was uh, conducting the assessment. And then on the right, after we've, we've done that field visit, we write up a, a document, a report that kind of explains, here's what we found in your woods. Here's what we're, how it matches up with the standards we developed. And the producers read through that, um, think about how can they um, adapt their forest management to make sure that all those bird habitat attributes are gonna be uh, thought about and be, um, be managed for. And then they sign off to say, we are, we're on board with this. We agreed to doing these things and we'd like to be part of your program, be recognized through your program. So from there, uh, we get into recognizing the producers. So here um, are just a, a couple of the producers in Vermont. And I apologize, I, I basically have Vermont photos here, um, but the same thing is, is also happening in New York State as well. And, and we'll see what the, the kind of the logo is for that um, here at the end. So there's uh, Matt and Caitlin, as I mentioned before, um, on the left. And then we've got folks, um, fan, you know, it's, this is really for people of all scales. We have uh, producers in Vermont. The producer with the highest number of taps is probably about 120,000 taps right now, which is a pretty, it's a very large operation. And we have folks down all the way to about 500 taps who are involved. So it's, it's not, a program that's just for um, small hobby producers, it's for uh, commercial producers as well. And all scales are really important if we're gonna be thinking about birds. Um, so we give them the sign that they can hang and, and, and proudly display to show that they are participating in this program. They can help to tell their customers that buy their products about their participation in the program when they, when they have that sign there. And then we also have the, the part about what to look for. So if I wanna go out and buy, uh, or if you want to go out and buy bird, uh, syrup, maple syrup, or ma other maple products from a bird-friendly sugar bush, what does he look for? Well, in Vermont, um, you would be looking for that scarlet tanager label. Um, as you can see, the center there, uh, that's, that's, again, from up at Jed's Maple, so on, kind of, they have a retail shop. That's some of their, their syrup there with the scarlet tanager label on it. Uh, Matt and Caitlin, Little Hogback Farm, I'd love showing there. Um, the way they're, they're packaging their products. So they've actually gone and they now put the logo. If you look at the left side of that bottle, you'll see um, the Scarlet Tanner is actually printed right onto that, that label that they have on their bottle. So they're not using the sticker anymore. They're actually just in, in, imprinting that on the label, which is awesome. And they're putting the Scarlet Tanager right there on it. So really appreciate that. Um, and, and using that as a great way to, to educate consumers about this, this great relationship between um, maple sugaring and bird conservation. And then on the right there, giving a little more close up look of what the label looks like here in Vermont. So when you, and you don't have to, you know, you can find this actually in, in retail stores, um, in some grocery stores I know I've been into, I've, I've had people tell me they've been places and they've, they've found the product. And as a matter of fact, my in-laws were visiting the state of Georgia a number of years ago and, and they actually came across syrup with the bird friendly Vermont, um, the Audubon bird friendly logo on it, which was pretty exciting to see. So one of our producers is kind of distributing around the country or, or more than one of them, but this was one in particular. So it's really great to see. So it's out there. Um, it may not be in all the, the places that you go when you go shopping for maple syrup, but it's something that you could start asking if your shop isn't carrying these things. The other place you can go um, is actually to both the Audubon New York and the Audubon Vermont websites, where we have pages that list the producers that are participating in the program, as well as ways to contact them. And, and num a number of them um, offer online sales so that you can have those products shipped directly to you. And these links will be provided to you, um, I believe, um, via follow-up email with, with these links, as well as Zach may have them in the chat. Um, but these are the places where you can find, if you'd like to purchase direct from the producer, uh, the currently, these, these, these products that were produced from our bird friendly sugar bushes. So the logos again on the bottom, these are the stickers essentially New York right now is using the one you see on the left, Vermont being the one on the right. And the, this is an image of one of the New York producers um, set up at a uh, market, I believe, and, and selling their products that way. And 
that pretty much wraps it up. That is the insider's look um, at the Bird Friendly Maple Project. And I certainly welcome um, any questions that folks have at this time. Um, again, if you would like to reach out and um, with more specific questions to either Zach or I, we will provide that contact information as well. Um, and we can go into a lot deeper dive on any of these things if, if folks are interested. But at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and um, I'll turn it back over to you, Zach, so that we can start to, to find out what kind of questions folks are having. Steve, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I thank you for that today. I hope everyone else did too. Um, so uh, like we said earlier, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can with the time we have remaining. And uh, Zach, um, to turn your camera on and uh, pitch the first question to Steve. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, so we've got a few questions that are kind of along uh, similar lines here. Um, so Matt asks, um, does the 25% cover apply to trees only or do shrubs and other uh, woody plants count? And um, I think people have some other questions about what other shrubs and woody plants would count in that understory cover. Okay, yeah. So. So there's kind of two, there's kind of two things, uh, two questions maybe in there that got, um, got aligned together. So the 25% figure that I gave was when it comes to the composition of the forest, right? We want to see a, a sugar bush that has at least 25% of its composition in something other than sugar maple. When it comes to the understory and the midstory structure that we have there, right? We want to encourage producers to think about management that will help promote that growth. We are looking for this, we have the same kind of number. We'd like to see on average at least 20% cover in these 25% cover in these different layers, understory, midstory. Um, so what qualifies in there, it would be shrubs, uh, seedlings, saplings, really any woody stemmed vegetation counts there, something what, that a bird could physically place its nest in and, and it would support their nest. The ferns that we saw earlier on in the presentation, the hasten and fern typically are not what we would count. So that was like 100% cover of ferns. That really is not what we're looking for. We want woody, woody stem plants that provide that structure. Now, some birds will nest. We find nests of things like veery or hermit thrush, um, sometimes down in the ferns, but really what we want are seedlings, saplings, and native shrubs to, to make up that percent cover. We've got a couple of questions that are also maybe multiple because they came up a few different uh, ways. But um, one was like, uh, Kathy asked, how do you convince landowners to keep the understory if it, if it makes getting to the taps and tubing more difficult? And sort of related to that, asked a couple of times is, um, do like larger mammals like run into that tubing, you know, like moose and deer and like tear things apart? Yeah. Um, well, to the first point there, it really, you know, what we can do is we can provide um, a perspective of why having that regeneration, as it's often called, that understory growth of trees and shrubs, why it's important, why it's important to songbirds, why it's important to forest health um, as the next generation forest, next cohort forest coming in there. Ultimately, it's up to the individual producers whether or not they, they find that to be something that they're willing to accommodate. Um, but sometimes it's just a matter of kind of providing that perspective where folks are like, oh, I hadn't really thought of it that way or um, you know, really it's kind of a very labor intensive to even to clear all that under story out. So uh, we provide the information and then folks are take that and, and make decisions on whether or not this is kind of the right program for them. So the question about whether the tubing inhibits the movement of large mammals, it's a great one. And it's one that we actually do not have um, a, a lot of evidence to support either way. Um, it's a hard one, uh, folks I've spoken to, have always said it's, it's, it's one of those things that's pretty hard, it'd be hard to, to study. I don't think it's impossible, but it's hard and, and it hasn't, hasn't really happened yet, although a lot of people would like it to. Um, so kind of as a, you know, like, like depending on where, how high that tubing is off the ground, a moose could go over it. Um, if it's a little higher, a deer could go under it. Sometimes though, it's right in the way and certainly moose and deer both have been known to take stuff, take things down. So you could raise your tubing up higher and then make it a lot easier for, for wildlife to move under it. Um, if you put it down too low, it tends to get buried in the snowpack, which is not something you want early in the season. So, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of unknowns with some of these things yet. 
And that's one of them is just what is the real time effect of that? In, in many cases, we're talking about hundreds of miles of tubing in some of these larger sugar bushes. Um, what does that have uh, the effect of that on not so much birds, I don't think, but on mammals, large mammals in particular? Great. I've got another question for you, Steve, from a familiar name out of Connecticut. Eric asks, um, asks, I think I heard you say that actively managing your forest can enhance the structural attributes that the birds you mentioned can use um, in a time frame that is useful. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so when we're actively managing that forest today, um, we can start to develop some of those structural features that we're looking for. Again, we're, we're creating some, some small openings in the canopy of the forest, allowing sunlight to get down on the forest floor. That's what we want. We want to encourage that new growth. When we passively manage the forest and, and do not go in and harvest any trees out, eventually trees will fall on their own, right? Whether it's the snag, but the snags tend, you know, they don't have foliage on them, so they're not doing a lot of shading anyway. But live trees eventually are going to fall down too, whether it's a wind event or some ice storm or something like that. Um, but the time frame for that to happen often is much longer. So natural events that come in and kind of disturb the forest, they don't happen on the same time frame. Therefore, we're not going to develop those structural characteristics um, as soon as we could if we were actively managing the forest. And from the perspective of habitat, right, we, we want that habitat now. Um, some of these birds are definitely in need of, of uh, assistance in terms of their population. So we don't want to wait another 50 years or, or 25 years you know, on the lower end before something might happen naturally to kind of open up that canopy and, and allow that regeneration to occur. Yeah, um, Steve, that leads, I was going to ask a different question, but that leads to one that I saw recently about, you know, how long does it take? you know, for that, that uh, sugar bush one we saw earlier, which is the fawn, the, the fern rather understory to something with, the, you know, some, you know, six or 10 foot high understory. I, obviously, there's a lot of factors, and you know, Zach's involved in a, some um, forest projects in New York about, you know, circling, you know, fairly substantial multi acre tracks of, 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 of woodland, you know, with fencing to keep the deer out, the deer browse, because I'm sure that's probably right. possibly the biggest factor with getting from um, to the ideal thing, but how long would it take yep. to keep the deer at bay? Yeah, yeah, great question. Again, it depends on a lot of factors, like you said, you know, the, what, what is the site condition, the soils that, that are there on that site will all be factors, but, you know, we're talking about multiple years, three, five or, or more years before things really get established on a really nutrient rich site, that'll happen a lot sooner, especially if there's not the deer browse or other pressures on that regeneration, but it takes time. You know, we, we as humans, we have a, especially in today's world, we have this instantaneous need for everything, right? We have information needs. I want it now, so I grab my phone. I, you know, I want things now. Forests are different. Um, forests work in forest time, and it's not always a time that matches with the way we think things should occur. So we have to be patient. We have to make sure that we understand what forest time is and what how long it will take for these things to happen. So don't don't look for it to for the forest to change overnight. It's always changing, but it's changing sometimes very subtly and very slowly. Um, and even when there's dramatic things that affect the forest, it can still take years before new growth really gets going to the point that it's meeting the needs of the birds. Okay, Steve, we've got another one for you that uh, I think speaks to maybe some of the concerns about people who are interested in participating in the program, but they might be leasing a sugar bush or, or buying syrup in bulk. Um, so Adam asks, if I'm a participant in the program, but also buy bulk syrup from another non-participating producer, can I still use the sticker, call myself a uh, participant? Yeah, that, and that question comes up um, a number of times. Um, and the answer really right, right now, the way the program is set up is that any syrup that someone is going to label as bird friendly really has to be coming from a forest that is being managed um, to intentionally for birds. So in the case of a lease, or if I'm buying syrup from someone else, really we don't want 
that syrup unless we've gone in and done the assessment and, and work on those woods to be labeled as such. That said, um, I'm pretty sure it ha it's happening in certain places. Um, and we haven't really kind of, we haven't cracked down on that right now. I mean, the key thing, we, we're, we're trying to improve conditions for birds. We're trying to make sure that the forest is healthy and we're trying to provide a way for producers to, to, to promote themselves and to stand out. Um, but we, it's something we want to kind of keep, keep tabs on and really encourage people to do what we're, you know, implementing the kinds of activities that we're, that we're encouraging. Um, got a couple of questions about um, how to recommend to some local uh, maple producing farms that they know of, you know, how to how to um, introduce them to this program that they might not know about. And at the same time, too, of uh, one of our forestry friends, one of our foresters, do we have any resources for um, for foresters to uh, to to, um, you know, be involved in this program or to, to use? These yeah. Concepts? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the, the a lot of the the guidelines and recommendations for bird friendly sugar bush management are in line with the same things that, that Audubon has been promoting through its healthy forest initiative now for enough for many years. We're really trying to to diversify structure and composition um, in the forest. And we have, you know, we have some handouts specifically on this program and brochures, uh, but it's not really a technical uh, bit of information. Um, Zach just put in there kind of some landowner guides that we have uh, in both New York and Vermont. We also have our in Vermont Foresters for the Birds um, information. But what we're actually working on right now, um, and I know there's some other, other groups here in Vermont, uh, Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, one of our key partners, is actually working on a project right now called Healthy Forest, Healthy Sugar Bushes, kind of coming up with best management practices. And we, we look forward to, to working with them on that so that some of the some of this messaging is getting out more to the professional forester audience. Um, again, it's really around just managing a healthy forest and, and many foresters are, are know how to do that um, when their clients ask for it or, or they can just kind of encourage their, their clients to do that as well. But um, that's the key. And so look forward to, to seeing more resources coming online um, over time that can speak more to that. Really quick question. It was just asked a couple of times. They were asking just about the tubing and such. And is that that left up year round? It was seen in some of the. It is okay. Yeah, it is. It is. So it's, yeah. So the buckets. If people are using buckets, those come down. Um, the tubing stays up, but what does come out is the 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 tap that goes into the hole. That gets pulled at the end of the season, and, and but stays there, hangs up, hangs there in the woods. We want that that hole in the tree to be able to to heal up. And seal itself off and a, a real healthy vigorous tree will do that um, within a growing season It'll start to you know you go back next year and you can you can still see where that hole was but it's it's already got um, tissue there that's that's grown back in place and kind of blocking it off because we don't want um, any disease to get in there um, and negatively impact the tree but um, it would be a lot of work to take all of that down annually and go back and it takes enough as it is just to tap the trees <laughs> on these large woods um, but yeah, so it does, stick, does stay up. Hey, um, Steve, we, we probably only got time for one more question. It's pretty popular today. We got a lot of them. I'm sure we haven't gotten to. So folks, if we haven't got to your question and you've got a burning desire to get it answered, I'll drop into the chat right now. Uh, the email address is um, from Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York. You can send us an email. We can send it to Steve or Zach and make sure you get answered in the, in the coming days. But um, uh, we got time for one more question. Hey Steve, one more uh, question here from a few folks who are interested in um, who to reach out to for this program and kind of what the timeline looks like for um, getting producers recognized for the program. Yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, it's um, in New York, it would be Zach here and in Vermont, it would be myself and we'll have those again if we don't have them up there yet. Um, get those emails in the chat. I think, Rich, you also mentioned maybe sending out some uh, links to folks who registered as well. We can include those um, in that. Uh, the timeline really, what we wanna be doing our visits with producers during the growing season, leaf on season, so that we can really see that structure ideally. So say we do that in summer 2022, um, you know, Zach and I both have other things on our plate. So we kind of um, have a busy time, but we get around to, reports in the winter 
Um, so typically I try to, before the next maple season, if I visit 2022 before sugaring 2023, um, get everybody their reporting and get them lined up and on board if they're interested before that happens. And I think the same is probably true in New York. Great. Well, Steve, Never possible. We, we will be sending out uh, a, uh, an email to all registrants in the next couple of days, thanks to our amazing communication staff. But Steve, I wanna thank you so much for this, for uh, presenting today. I think everybody is very interested in this. We had a great, great turnout. And thank you, Zach, for um, for joining us. Um, I hope uh, I hope everyone will join us for our next webinar. It'll be a, a month from today, on March sixteenth. And Allison Sant, uh, the author of From the Ground Up: Local Efforts to Create to Create Resilient Cities, she'll lead a panel to discuss how nature can help us adapt to the threats of climate change. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. And thanks again, Stephen Zach. You bet. Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye.